Let's go ahead and let's get going today. Uh, week 16, how to grow number four, breathe in and breathe out. And we've been talking about breathing in, that is to say, um, taking in the scriptures, letting the promises of God take root in our hearts, um, getting the truth of God into our bloodstream, as it were, uh, so that it runs through us and so that it's, uh, it's controlling us and, uh, and uh, determining the course of our lives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but today we're going to shift a little bit in this same week to talk about breathing out, and in particular we're going to be talking about uh, prayer and the importance of the discipline of prayer, uh, the discipline of prayer. So uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's uh, start off by doing exactly that, praying, and then we'll talk about it. Let's pray. So Father, today we commit our time to you and we pray that you would have your will among us, pray that you would teach us and shepherd us by your grace, and uh, that the scriptures, uh, which are uh, holy and are set apart for uh, your shepherding of us, uh, would come alive. In a, in a way that they already are, but simply that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear. And so bless our time, whether we're here in Sunday school, whether we're fellowshipping between services uh, or, uh, taking, uh, or going into service where we're going to be taking Lord's Supper later. Uh, meet with us, O oh Lord, we pray, and, uh, and we pray that your kingdom uh, would be palpable in our midst. And uh, we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we spent last week talking about Um, talking about breathing in, taking in the scriptures, um, and we ended with with a reflection upon Psalm 1 uh, and all of the promises uh, that come from that psalm uh, that are given to us um, if we meditate upon the law of the Lord. And I probably should have left them up on the board, but I erased them. Um, But uh, but you know, you know, if you know that psalm well, we're promised blessing. Um, delight, attention, all those kind of things that we talked about last week. Well, today we're going to move to that third supporting idea, um, and uh, that is thinking more about prayer uh, as a gift uh, given to us. Now, people have been praying ever since, um, I think ever since being cast out of the Garden of Eden, where we've not been in God's full presence, uh, prayer has been Uh, hopefully the pursuit of people who are calling upon the Lord. You might remember in Genesis 4, it says that uh, right at the end of the genealogy, uh, it says that that's the time that people began to uh, call upon the Lord. Actually, I think it's it's right right before the genealogy in Genesis 5, right at the end of chapter 4, it says people began to call upon the Lord. We can see prayer becoming an important uh, important thing. Uh, Well, our Lord, in that third supporting idea, tells us of the importance of prayer with the so-called Lord's Prayer. Now, sometimes uh, we, sometimes we hear certain uh, things that, certain phrases that sort of capture teaching of Scripture, and we think that those phrases actually are inspired phrases. Uh, but Lord's Prayer is not something that He Himself said. Um, he didn't use that phrase, but it's called the Lord's Prayer because it was His prayer that He taught uh, His disciples to pray. And in that prayer, he tells us how to pray in a way that sets our hearts above where Christ is, Colossians 3, 2, and 3. And I think that the Lord's Prayer is worth meditating upon uh, every line. And so actually, there are two scriptures, two scriptures uh, where the Lord's Prayer is outlined. One of them is in Matthew 6, verses 9 and following. And then another one is in Luke 11. And really just verse 1 and following. So uh, what I want to do is I, I, I want to focus I want to focus on the Matthew 6 version of it. But, I want, but before you turn there, I want you to see the background. Um, at least in another, another time when our Lord taught, you know, was talking about it. The background is given in Luke 11. I think this is a very important thing. So flip over to Luke 11 real quick and then we'll go back to Matthew 6. Um, but probably there was another time when our Lord was, uh, was talking about prayer other than the Sermon on the Mount. And so it stands to reason that he would teach the same thing twice. People need repetition. Uh, we know this. And uh, whereas in Matthew 6, he's in the Sermon on the Mount, he's speaking broadly to a larger group. In Luke 11, 
uh, something else is happening. I want you to see something here in Luke 11, 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Now, what I want you to see first here is that uh, our Lord needed to pray. Um, I, I hesitate to say that Jesus needs anything or that he ever needed anything. Nevertheless, regularly, especially throughout the Gospel of Luke in the early half, the first half of Luke, our Lord is praying all the time. Luke 5, he would withdraw to lonely places and pray. At the end of Luke 5, maybe at the beginning of Luke 6, it says that he was up all night praying before he was going to call his 12. Um, so he's praying regularly. And here, um, he's doing it again. If, if he needs to pray, I mean, if the Lord Jesus has to spend time in prayer with his Father, what makes us think that it's going to be any different for us? Uh, what makes us think that we should neglect prayer and that everything's going to be all right? Now, nobody, I, again, I've said this many times, I don't think that there's anybody here who, if I were to ask the question, who here thinks that they have a healthy enough prayer life? I don't think anybody's going to raise their hand. I think we all wish that we could be a little stronger in our prayer life. Um, nevertheless, uh, it is a, it is, you know, it's kind of our natural propensity to neglect prayer and to find other things to, uh, to use our time on. Our Lord regularly was going to his Father and praying. And the disciples then ask him because they see him doing this so often. They, they regularly saw him praying all the time. And so they say, Lord, teach us to pray. Like John taught his, taught his disciples, teach us to pray. I want you to notice here that they don't ask him, teach us how to pray. Um, they don't ask him, actually, for a script. Um, they say, teach us to pray, which could be put in a different, in a different uh, way. Make us prayerful. Teach us how to be a prayerful people. Um, and then that's the background uh, with, which he, uh, with which he gives them the Lord's Prayer here uh, in Luke's version. When you pray, he says, say. So again, just keep in mind, teach us to pray is make us prayerful. And so here's Jesus' answer. When you pray, say something. If you say these words, the idea here is that they're going to have the effect in your life of making you prayerful. It's... Um, I'm trying to give a way to illustrate this off the top of my head. Perhaps I can't. Um, but make us prayerful. Okay, pray this. This will make you more prayerful. It's like they, if, you, if you have these words come out of your mouth, it's going to keep you coming back uh, for more. So, Father, he says, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Um, now, go ahead if you can, uh, keep, maybe keep like a bookmark or a pencil or a pen or something in that uh, text there in Luke 11 and flip back to Matthew 6 because this is the more full version of this prayer. And, and you know, let's be honest, we know this by heart. Most of us know this by heart. I try to pray according to the general framework of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, every Sunday when I'm doing the pastoral prayer. And that's fairly new. That's probably within the last six months, but I think it's a good um, appropriation of the Lord's Prayer for our uh, prayer uh, purposes here. But I think that it's worth meditating upon every single line of, uh, of this prayer. So, our Father in heaven, what we have here is a theological statement. It's also in a ecclesiological statement. You say, Pastor, you got too many syllables already. Ecclesi I'm not even spelling it the right way. Ecclesiological. It's a theological statement and an ecclesiological statement. To say our Father, to focus on Him as Father, uh, is to make a statement about God's nature. Um, before, you've heard me talk about this before, and I think it's worth repeating. Before God became creator, he was father. In eternity, he is father and son. And this is important for us to understand 
that it is in his nature to be relational. Um, the Father and the Son eternally enjoying one another, and then creation is the overflow of that fellowship. So he creates because he wants the creation to be a theater of his glory, and he creates people in his image because he wants to have fellowship with them as well. Um, he wants them to enjoy uh, his glory. To say Father is to say you, you, start your, you start your prayer by focusing your attention on his identity. But furthermore, furthermore, it's an ecclesiological statement too because it doesn't say start with Father. Uh, I think maybe in the other one it does. Yeah, yeah, in Luke 11, Jesus says to start with Father. But here, when he's preaching to this large group of people, he says, start with our Father. Remember that you are not alone. No Christian is an island, as it were. He's our Father. Furthermore, in heaven, so his location, that is to say, in heaven, in the place of eternity in which he inhabits, Isaiah 57, 15, he inhabits eternity. Um, again, that goes with theology. Um, our Father in heaven, this cultivates in us a heaven-mindedness. It lifts our eyes up from the things that we're experiencing in this life. And I don't know about you, but when I'm coming to pray, that's what I need. I need my eyes lifted from the things of this life, especially if I'm praying in the morning, because uh, those who know me really well know that I just, I just really struggle to get going in the morning. It's not just because my kids go to bed way too late, um, and then I have to get up early. And even on the days, even on the days when I don't have to get up for school, you know that if you get up the same time five days a week, the other two days, you're probably going to get up at about the same time. I really struggle to get going in the morning. And what I need is my eyes lifted out of just my, my absolute wretchedness that I have when I'm, when I'm getting up in the morning while the coffee is, is slowly but surely, you know, starting to get pumped. I need my eyes lifted up out of the wretchedness. And that's what he, that's what he does. He says to us, call out to your Father who is in heaven. Like we're, I said that we need to reflect upon every line in my Bible the line, our Father in heaven, like that's just one line, and we've already, we've already been, I've been talking about it for five minutes already. There's so much here, so much content here to reflect upon. Now, let me just say a couple more things about this, and then maybe I can open it up for some thoughts. Uh, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I would say that you could summarize verse 10 of Matthew 6 under the heading of deference. I think I'm spelling it the right way. Deference. Um, deferring to him. Deferring to him. Your kingdom come. We want the Lord's kingdom to come in the world. Your will be done, which is another, which I think is an explanation of your kingdom come. Because the Lord's kingdom comes as his will is done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. So we're starting off our prayer here with theological statements, um, lifting our eyes, an ecclesiological statement, we are not alone, our Father, he's in heaven, he lifts our eyes, and we are deferring to him and saying, have your will in our lives. Um, do what you want, Lord, before anything else. Do what you want. Let your name be hallowed. For his name to be hallowed, by the way, it's the same word for uh, sanctification, it's that hagios, uh, idea for his name to be hallowed and treated as pure and perfect. To say, hallowed be your name, Lord, is an absolute prayer of deference, isn't it? Whatever you got to do, Lord, whatever you have to do to make your name be hallowed in my life, I pray that you would do it. Um, and uh, it's a scary prayer uh, because uh, the Lord will answer it. He'll answer that prayer. And, uh, and it's going to probably bring a lot of trial and fire and all of that kind of stuff. But, um, but just notice how he's starting off the prayer here with just total deference to him. Any thoughts on any of this? I've been talking a lot here about the prayer so far, but there's just so, so much here. It's interesting to me that he, he focuses our attention on theology to start off uh, the so-called uh, Lord's Prayer. Thoughts? Go ahead, Jeff. Just a thought Really interesting to think about it, but it 
doesn't say um, father of all. Yeah. That's a, that's another important point. That's right. Heaven, yeah. Um, which the universalists would say, you've heard it, you've all heard it, God is the father of all. You know, there's, it's exclusive to God's people. Mm -hmm. Only those who have come to know him through Christ mm -hmm. can go and say, um, say, our father, because the, the rest of that time is of their father, the devil. Yeah. That's, uh, that's too exclusivistic for, uh, for the postmodern time in which we find ourselves. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a snarky little comment on my part because everybody's exclusivist. Everybody thinks that people on the other side should be, should be excluded, meaning that, like, meaning that, you know, the atheists and the non-Christians and all that, like, they, they want to exclude believers uh, as well. So there's this kind of universal idea of in crowd and out crowd. Um, so that's a common denominator. So that leads us, so it cancels out. It doesn't matter who says, who says uh, among all of us who's in the in crowd or who's in the out crowd. It comes down to who does Jesus say. And what Jesus says, um, those, who, those who are adopted by faith in Christ, they are the in crowd. Now that's, it's very inclusive because it can open up. Anybody can get in on this. Uh, it's an invitation uh, into it, but it's only an invitation that can really be received if you accept the prerequisite that you are not a child of God unless you embrace the Son of God. And um, it's interesting in John 8 when Jesus says, you are of your father the devil. Who's he talking to there? He's talking to, he's talking to Jewish people, people who are descended of Abraham. And because of how they're treating the Son of God, they're proving that they are not children of God. Now, if they change how they treat the Son of God, they, they're adopted, become sons of light, Jesus says later in John 12. But um, in essence, to start, to start with our Father is to say, pray from a prayer closet in the family home. You know, you're not in the wilderness uh, but, but think of yourself as being at home with the family uh, when you're praying. Because all the people of God, they're praying this way throughout the world as well. Beautiful point. Uh, good, and a good, good sort of, sort of like, a, I'm sort of focusing over here on not being alone and how he wants us to think in, in inclusive terms of the family of God. On the other hand, exclusive terms that not everybody can, can say that. It's a good point. Other thoughts on, uh, on these things before we move into the next phrases that our Lord gives. Um, okay, so the next thing Theology, ecclesiology, location, verse 10, deference. Verse 11, provision. By the way, my little sister lost a tooth on a church pew one time uh, when we were really little. It wasn't even the church that we go to. There was a concert. Um, so uh, there's, I wonder if they still have the same pews and if there's still that little tiny chip in the back of the, in the, back of the pew. It's entirely possible. Um, provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. This has both a physical and tangible um, element to it. It also has a spiritual element to it as well. Christ is the true bread that comes down out of heaven. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Spiritual element. Uh, but the plain reading give us this day our daily bread, uh, it seems to me like the first thing that we think when we read this is physical bread, 
and based on how the Lord is teaching people how to pray and the fact that later on in the chapter, he's going to be focusing their attention on the fact that God will provide uh, your daily bread and God will provide everything that you need. It seems like it seems like that's one thing that he's talking about, but there's also a spiritual element to it as well. Um, so, so provision, Lord, what I need is both physical and spiritual. I'm a, I'm a duality, as it were. I'm not just physical and I'm not just spiritual. So give me, give me my daily bread that I need. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, that it's daily bread, um, not weekly, uh, not monthly, not every few days, but Lord, what I need for today. Help me to have what I need for today and to just live that way. And that's going to be a theme throughout the rest of Matthew 6 that Jesus is going to be unpacking is living day by day, living day by day. It's funny when I'm in, on pastoral calls with people who are like going through surgeries or having recovered from surgeries or, or going through grief or something like that, a phrase that gets repeated often, whether it's from myself or from the person on the other end, is uh, it's just a day at a time, just taking it a day at a time. And um, it's probably sad that it takes grief or pain for us to think in those terms when our Lord told us we're supposed to think like that all the time. Just live a day at a time. You know, we're not promised tomorrow uh, in, on this earth. Now, we're promised eternity with God for forever, but this might be the last 24-hour cycle in this body that I have. I don't, it very well might be. So just... Deal with today, he says at the end of the chapter, sufficient for the day is its own, is its own trouble. By the way, by the way, one, one thing related to that. I was looking this up, and uh, the word for trouble, it's the word, um, I think it's kakia or kakos or something like that. It's the same word, yeah, kakia. Uh, it's the same word that is, is the name of some ancient goddess of evil, I think. Um, I might have to get back to you on this, but... Um, it, it does come up at, at several points through the, uh, through the New Testament, 11 different times. Um, but the definition, if you're looking on Bible study tools, of kakia, and again, I'm talking about the end of Matthew 6, 34, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Um, definition, malignity, malice, ill will, desire to injure, <laughs> wickedness, depravity, Wickedness that is not ashamed to break laws, evil or trouble. Sufficient for the day, Jesus says, is its own desire to injure. <laughs> that's, that's the point that he's making there. Why would you focus on tomorrow when there's enough to have to focus on today? There's enough storms to weather today. So Lord, give me my daily bread today. Make sure that I have what I need today. That's, that is plenty, plenty to have to think about, plenty to have to have to worry about. Tomorrow will take care of itself, he says. Um, okay, okay, so provision, tangible and spiritual. Next we have forgiveness. Maybe we'll put it like this. Grace receiving whoops and grace giving. Grace receiving and grace giving. I might even add to this bottom part here, prerequisite. Because Jesus is saying the prerequisite for grace receiving is grace giving as well. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And this is such an important point that he's going to then give commentary on it when the prayer is over, isn't he? For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, this is there's been a lot of ink spilt on this over the last 2,000 years. Um, I think that Paul gives us a helpful commentary in Colossians 3 when he says, as you've been forgiven, so forgive others. Um, just the idea here is, if, if, you've not, if, if you're not showing grace, to others who have hurt you, you've not understood grace. And if you've not understood grace, you've not really trusted in Christ's atoning work. So the idea here is, this is an appeal to the gospel. Forgive me, O Lord, uh, because while I'm a saint, I'm also still a sinner. 
Uh, and yet, the prerequisite is that I have to be keeping short accounts with other people as well. And this is difficult because we're hurt all the time. People are hurting us, sometimes not apologizing. Sometimes hurts that happen in childhood can kind of stick with us for the rest of our lives, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we have to have the same kind of short account mentality and have a willingness to um, a willingness to forgive if we would receive the same grace uh, from the Lord. It's just interesting to me that he includes, as we also have forgiven our debtors in this prayer. Um, it's the only real, it's the, I would say it's the only real implicit admonition in the prayer. The rest of the prayer is, I see your hands, Celeste, but the rest of the prayer is, um, is here's what you say to God, but then there's this little parenthetical now here's what you also must do. You must go and forgive as well. Go ahead, Celeste. I kind of talking about forgiveness because I hold on to it. Um, and I think it's a minister, one of those interesting voice said, I have to forgive my father mm. so I can go on even what I've gone through, what I've grown through. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's still hard for me to get close to men because of that, but I have the Lord on my side now, yeah. so I can help other people going through. Yeah. Um, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful testimony. Would you say, and maybe this is a little personal, so just don't answer if you don't want to, but um, would you say that a struggle with dad growing up also caused a struggle with God as you were beginning to grow in your faith? No. Not at all, huh? Yeah. Because I know some people, it's the opposite. They have, if they have a bad relationship with, uh, with dad growing up and maybe were hurt, they struggle with their faith in God. You're saying it was the opposite. You were running to the Lord. You knew that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it still bothers me. When they smell apple on somebody, I feel that little piece in there. I wish I could get rid of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, my stomach flips. Yeah, maybe it's a maybe it's a divine reminder of uh, where you've come from, so that you can be thankful for where the Lord's brought you. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, I think that's a good example of what we're talking about. A lot of us have really, have really um, been hurt. And, um, and uh, in order for us to, um, in order for us to really be able to, to know the grace of the gospel, um, we have to have some degree of understanding of how sin affects a person. That might, be a, that might be one of the points here that maybe is, is neglected. I've neglected it too, that, um, you know, I, I don't think that sin hurts God. I mean, God's happy in himself. When Nehemiah talks about the joy of the Lord, he's talking about how the Lord has joy. Uh, he's not served by human hands, all of that. But sin disrupts God's created purposes and destroys the, the peace for which he created it. And the reason he gets angry over sin is because of that. It's because it's going to hurt us and it's going to hurt others. And so, to some degree, we have to have maybe some understanding of having been wronged, if we can understand um, how we have wronged. Um, I don't know if what I'm saying makes a whole lot of sense. Hopefully it does, but uh, I think that in some way, it's just, it's significant to me that Jesus devotes more words to grace receiving and grace giving in this whole section than he does anything else. Uh, because I think that he knows it's going to be important, and there's probably a um, there's probably some degree of 
you've got to understand um, the effects of sin and having to give grace if you can understand and appreciate that God is the ultimate grace giver and the ultimate forgiver as well. Just really wonderful verse. I don't remember where it's at right now, but it has just helped me so much. It says, um, He that has been forgiven much, loveth much. Yeah. And what that verse is saying is that to the extent that we appreciate and feel how much we've been forgiven, yeah. to that degree, we will love other people. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so, if you are a person who doesn't feel like you know you've messed up that much, or you know, yeah, I've been forgiven a few things, but you know, if, if you minimize your own sinfulness and the incredible way that God has forgiven us, then we will be minimal in the, the love and the grace that we show to other people. Yeah. Really important part of that. That's right. Yeah, and I think that that's, that sticks um, really close with that Colossians verse, as you've been forgiven, so forgive. Um, it, it is an important, very important point, very important point, and uh, that text that Jeff referred to was in Luke 7, when uh, the woman comes anointing Jesus' hair with uh, his hair. She's not anointing his hair, I think that this is the one where she's anointing his feet uh, with her hair. Um, but, uh, but then everybody's judging her and all of that. You remember what Jesus says. Uh, it's because she's been forgiven so much that she loves uh, much. But the idea here is, have been forgiven, now go forgive. Um, and that's the perspective he takes there. That's what Paul talks about in Colossians later in Matthew 18, when Jesus is talking about if your brother uh, offends you, 70 times 7, you forgive him. It's that same kind of idea that because you've been forgiven, forgive. Here, um, he, in a very interesting way, he flips it. And he makes, he makes grace receiving depend actually upon grace giving uh, in this passage. In probably what's the most, what's the the most memorized section of scripture in all of church history, I think. He flips it, and uh, maybe I'm reading a little too much into it, uh, but he does say there in verses 14 and 15, if you forgive others, your Father will also forgive you. If you don't forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so, so to your point, Jeff, on one hand, On one hand, many New Testament texts follow this trajectory. Forgiven, forgive. Um, Luke 7, Matthew 18, Colossians 3. Forgiven, forgive. That's a little bit, maybe a more logical kind of way of, it makes sense to us. Here, purposefully, when we come to prayer, He wants us to flip it and think in terms of forgive, forgiven. Not because our justification literally does depend on the short accounts that we have with everybody else, but because um, he's seeking to purify our hearts and our motives as we are coming to the Lord to ask for forgiveness. Okay, well, how's your, how are your accounts with other people? Um, so the Bible's full. I mean, if it, it's a lot more manageable. Like, it's a lot more manageable if it's one or the other. If it's because you're forgiven, therefore forgive, or if it's, if you, if, uh, you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. It's much more manageable that way. But our Lord, he actually gives both sides of it because God is not a God who we can manage, but a God who speaks prophetically to us and, 
and applies his word and his truth to, to like both sides where we would, where we would uh, try to find back doors to wiggle out of doing God's will. He says, nope, nope. If you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. On the other hand, the only way you can forgive is if you understand that you've been forgiven. And everywhere around us, he hedges us in. That being said, we're, we're uh, going to be running out of time. Uh, forgiveness, and then verse 13. Um, we'll call this shepherding. 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 Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or deliver us from the evil one. Um, the great redemption through the Old Testament narrative is, uh, is the Exodus, where God literally leads the people out of slavery, leads them through the wilderness, leads them into the land, promises in the prophets he's going to lead them one day to, uh, uh, into, this, into this redemptive state, this final day, Lord's Day state. Um, and Jesus picks up on that here by saying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This has been, uh, this is in light of what he had said in the previous chapter about all these sins that happen in the heart before they actually happen outwardly, right? So, um, you've heard us said, don't murder. I say anger, harboring anger is pretty close. So, don't even let it grow inside. Uh, you've heard us said, don't commit adultery. I say lust is adultery in God's eyes. Don't let it, don't let it grow. Uh, squash it before it gets there. You've heard us say love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He's driving the law of God inwardly because the new covenant promise was that the law would be written on their hearts. So because of this, because sin is so close, not only is it out there, but it's, it's in us. The sinful flesh is there, and he's been making that clear. He then says, pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, shepherd us, O Lord, keep us from the devil. And um, by the way, that phrase, that phrase at the end of the prayer, uh, we might call, we might call doxology. Is it? Let me see here. Does, um, those of you who have it, not in the margin, the, the um, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Is that still in verse 13? Like if it's in the text, not in the margin, is it still verse 13 or does it, it doesn't start verse 14, does it? Verse 13, okay. All right, so verse 13, A is shepherding. Verse 13, B is doxology. And even if that's not in the original, even if Jesus didn't actually say that, um, because it's possible that he did, it's possible that he didn't, that's why the Bibles, all of our Bibles, either have a footnote attached to that or they put that in the margin, because we're not really sure based on the manuscripts if he said it or not. Even if he didn't say it there, Christ as the eternal word of God said it when David was praying. Uh, taking uh, offerings for the tabernacle, or excuse me, for the temple. When he began his prayer, and this is uh, 1 Chronicles 29.11, I'll, I'll write it up here, uh, but 1 Chronicles 29.11, when David begins his prayer and he says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Seems to me, that whether Jesus said it or not, whether Jesus said it or if it was added in a later, uh, later manuscript or something, they were taking what David prayed back at the, uh, in the temple offerings. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Uh, that was First Chronicles. So what did I say, 2911? Um, and it ends, again, the prayer begins with heaven-mindedness, theology, Understanding who we are as the people of God, um, deference to his will, and then it ends with submission to his kingship, his lordship, and saying, whatever you want to do, Lord, that's, that's best. Whatever I want to do, maybe I'm saying, maybe I'm wrong, 
So Lord, lead me and shepherd me and have your will. And I just want to I, I take you back here, and I'm going to close here in a, in a minute, and I'm going to open it up for some, for some other comments. I want to take you back to Luke 11. Go back to Luke 11 with me. Um, after he ends the Luke version of the Lord's Prayer, he then goes through this big teaching about uh, which of you who has a friend will go at midnight. Uh, just the idea here that if you ask the Lord, he's going to give it to you. Um, if you, Whatever you bring to him, he's going to answer you if it's what you need. That's kind of his point between verses 5 and 12. Look what he says in verse 13. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, this is a little striking and a little surprising, isn't it? You wouldn't expect him to say, how much will the Father give you the Holy Spirit? I think it's on purpose. And the reason I think it's on purpose is because if you're praying this way, how he is said to pray, your mind is kingdom focused. You're focused on the kind of life where you're deferring to him, asking for his will to be done in your life, it's not my will, Lord, but it's your will. It's not my kingdom, it's your kingdom. Forgive me, help me to be forgiving. Let me live just a day at a time. All of that, lead me away from temptation and sin, oh Lord. If you pray like that, you're looking at it and you're probably saying, who could possibly live this way? I'm gonna need the Holy Spirit in order to live this way. So if you bring your, if you bring, if this is your prayer vernacular, um, understand the Father's going to give the Holy Spirit to you so that you not only pray this way, but you can live this way as well. That is why I think it's purposeful that they ask, teach us to pray. Make us a prayerful people. And he says, okay, pray like this. That'll change your thinking. You'll start to feel your need for the Lord and the need for the Spirit, and he's going to give it to you to help you to, help you to live this way. Thoughts on these things uh, as we uh, close out today? Thoughts on, well, it's a lot, I know. Karen. Yeah, and the, uh, and the parallel to this in the Sermon on the Mount, actually, uh, he does say, how much more will your father give good gifts to those who ask him? Uh, but here, you know, he's, he's really focusing their attention on the Spirit as the gift of God. Because ultimately, the Spirit is what we need. Um, the Spirit empowers us. The Spirit helps us. The Spirit keeps our eyes on Christ. Um, we could go on and on about the Spirit's... Um, uh, the Spirit's mission in our lives, as it were. And again, as, we, as we're thinking in these kind of kingdom-centered, God-centered terms, like Paul said, who's, who is sufficient for these things? Um, but our sufficiency can come from the Lord if it's the Holy Spirit who's helping us. So absolutely. Um, oftentimes what happens, to your point, Karen, I'm praying for all these things that I think that I need, and his answer is the Holy Spirit. To, uh, to live in a way that um, defers to him. Jeff? I think it's noteworthy that the Lord's Prayer, as we've been looking at it, it's, it's almost totally request-oriented. So if you go through it, except for the doxology, every single line is a request. And that's really, if you think about it, only about one-third of our prayer life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Obviously, thanksgiving is a huge, huge part of our prayer life. Mm -hmm. and, and then confession. Mm -hmm. So I know very, very often, you know, for, for me, um, my prayer time would begin with, with 
thanksgiving uh, and praise just to warm my heart to how God has answered all mm -hmm. these very things. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, then move into confession and, and then the requests follow uh, very much along that uh, outline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's an important point where we don't want to act as though this is the only thing the New Testament says about prayer. Um, giving thanks in all circumstances, Colossians 3 says, this is the sacrifice that I will accept. God says in Psalm 50, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. So certainly, um, thanksgiving is absolutely important. Perhaps it's implicit, our Father in heaven, um, which is to acknowledge that we are created and derivative and provided for. Give us this day our daily bread as you have in the past. Perhaps it's implicit. <clears throat> Elsewhere in the New Testament, it's explicit, certainly, certainly. Um, <clears throat> But I think that's a that's a good point that so much in it is uh, it's again request oriented. Text I uh, quoted just then was Colossians three seventeen. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I might have even implied Philippians four. Um, no, maybe not. Maybe not. I just can't think of it right now giving thanks in all circumstances. Um, so the reason why we focus on this today is not just because this is how our Lord explicitly said uh, to pray, uh, but because I'm convinced that if this becomes our prayer language, it will make us prayerful. Um, it focuses our attention heavenward where our Father is, living a day at a time. Um, it puts the responsibility on us to be grace-giving. Um, we're seeking to not sin and stay away from the enemy, and we're, we are finishing by remembering uh, his lordship, his kingship, and his kingdom. And uh, we need that kind of orientation, don't we? And so that's why he teaches us to pray uh, exactly like this. So in order for us to breathe in Scripture and to breathe out prayer... This is what our Lord says um, should be our approach. And um, just would uh, hope and pray that you would <clears throat> take it to heart, excuse me. And uh, daily, as the fourth heading there says, daily carry scripture in your mind and pray without ceasing, uh, as the psalm says. I pray that, as actually First Thessalonians says, I was looking at a psalm text here. The Christian life is a life of groaning. Let's just be honest. We're going to be groaning the rest of our lives. Um, creation groans, and not only creation, but we ourselves. It's in Corinthians 5. In this tent, we groan. We are not ever going to be as healthy in our prayer lives as we would like to be, but we can grow in them. And uh, that's our responsibility. And so maybe a, uh, a takeaway today, just to close, would be Maybe commit that, uh, that every day this week, um, when you have your prayer time or your time in your prayer closet, as it were, maybe commit to praying according to the Lord's Prayer, line by line, sort of lingering there. Um, if you journal, maybe what you do is you can, on the paper, write it down with a few lines between it and think about the things that you pray for, where they would fit. Uh, underneath like each line as a heading. That might be a good exercise. I, I've done that in the past. I think it is a good exercise. Um, and um, just see what the Lord will do. Um, I probably got to stop because it's 1036. Let's pray. So our Lord, today we thank you for teaching us to pray. And even as we saw earlier, when you were on earth, when your feet were on our ground, um, you were constantly going to the Father in prayer. And if the Lord had to do that himself, how much more is it the case for us? Teach us, O oh Lord, to pray. May we have these words on our hearts, and may we breathe in the word of God and breathe out our prayers and petitions 
to God who hears us, God who listens, and God who knows what we need. Be with us as we go into worship in the coming minutes. I pray, O Lord, that as we take the Lord's Supper, we would take it in a worthy manner. And uh, we commit this time to you in Christ's name. Amen.